Uh, Please bless our time together this morning in Bible class as well as in worship. May we exalt your name. May we uh, be in awe of your presence and your holiness. Uh, Thank you so much, Father, for Jesus, our Savior. And we thank you, Father, for revealing your word to us and giving us uh, the opportunity, Father, to contemplate these great truths. May we be strengthened by them. May we uh, serve you better. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who've been mentioned in the past weeks, those struggling with health issues. We do continue to lift up Mike uh, and Kathy in our prayers, and thank you, Father, for the opportunity for their treatment. Um, Father, there are many who've been mentioned and many who are struggling and dealing with other obstacles. We continue to lift them up before your throne. We, Father, ask you to be with us now as we open our eyes and hopefully open our hearts to the truth that you've revealed to us this day in the name of jesus we pray amen so uh we are going to go ahead and turn to joshua chapter 6 that's going to be our lesson this morning and if you have the handout you see it is the battle of jericho and uh, we've already kind of made preparation for this in last week's lesson when joshua met the commander of the army of the lord And you'll see how this segues right into Joshua chapter 6, and I think some important concepts there, some of of which we introduced last week. But if you'll notice there at the top of your notes, it says, Having met the commander of the Lord's army, Joshua now receives instruction from him, and therefore he prepares for the first battle of the conquest. So we've gone five chapters and the actual conquest hasn't started yet, right? But now we're going to begin the battle uh, uh, and the the battles for the land. And so this actually covers almost all of chapter 6. I have verses 1 through 24. Those are the uh, the verses we'll try to to cover here. But the point that I want to make, and I think you probably heard this made several times if you've been uh, in the church for, for long, but the battle of Jericho is a great illustration of the kind of faithful obedience that God requires of his people. Uh, And I have there, he requires it of his people in order to receive his gifts of grace and be blessed with hope and holiness. So we're going to see how that plays out. I don't know what's going on with this uh, uh, microphone, but do you all hear it crackling? Um, here, there, that probably fixed it right there. I don't know if it keeps doing it. I may have to set up a different microphone or something. But, uh, so, uh, as you can see there, I have about four, I have four main points. And again, this is a, a very a basic lesson, I think, but you know, as well as I do that many in the denominational world would chide us because we do claim that man's Uh, response to the gospel is necessary in order for us to receive God's grace. Uh, Many, especially in the Calvinistic world, those who believe that God does it all from beginning to end, he's the one who regenerates you and gives you faith, and therefore you are completely passive in all of this whole process. Uh, They do not seem to grasp the biblical teaching on this, that God does require our free will response to his offer of grace. Uh, but that our free will response to his offer of grace does not in any way earn or merit his grace. And there's nothing in our response that somehow works our own forgiveness, right? That's all a gift of God's grace and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, And so we try to make that point, but oftentimes it falls on deaf ears. But I think that this battle of Jericho is a great place to go as an Old Testament example, uh, perhaps a type of the kind of obedience and response of faith that God does require. And I think you all have probably heard that basic message before. And so that's really what this outline is all is all about. And so let's look at that and see how this uh, how this comes to play. So the first point I have here is the the commandment, the instructions the requirements from the commander of the army of the Lord, right? So uh, I believe it's still the speaker that we see in verse 15 of chapter 5 that the commander of the Lord's army says to Joshua, 
take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And so Joshua did so. And this sets the stage for the next few verses where the commander, who's the, the real commander, right? He's going to give Joshua instruction. And then Joshua is going to give the instructions of the commander to the rest of Israel. It says in verse 1, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel, and none went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So there is the instructions. Uh, and I have here, they're, they're very specific, right? Uh, they're very detailed, and this is exactly what you're supposed to do. Uh, walk around the city once for six days and seven times on the seventh day, and then blow the trumpet and make a shout. So there's nothing difficult about understanding what God wants them to do. I think the question might come in as to why in the world do you want us to do that, right? That's not exactly a common military tactic, but I think that's going to be the point. As it says here in letter B, it's, this is what I call a purely positive command from God. In other words, God could have said, uh, stand on one leg for an hour and then, you know, pick up a rock and toss it over your right shoulder. I mean, purely positive because... What they're doing is not directly related to the destruction of the wall. That's a gift from God. But God is testing their faith, right? He's saying, I want you to respond to my commandments, and I want you to respond in faith, trusting my, uh, my words. Uh, so I have here a couple of examples, like uh, number one says, Naaman balked whenever he was told to... Remember, he had leprosy. He was told to dip seven times in the Jordan River. So the prophet of God told him to go to this River Jordan and go down into it seven times. And you can remember his reply. It's like, this is ridiculous. Why would I do something like this? It's a dirty river, first of all. And second of all, it doesn't do anything to cure leprosy. And uh, he was then kind of instructed by his slave girl, you remember, uh, this is a prophet of God who's telling you this, and so maybe you ought to trust what God is saying here and just obey. And that's, of course, what he did. That's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 5. But I think it's the same principle. You can get these kinds of lessons from these Old Testament examples. Let me slow down just a little bit. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Yes. That's obedience. I mean, right. Yes. What else do you do if you don't obey? I mean, it doesn't, that requires a response. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. I would imagine before the Bible, they, you know, it was easy to um, question. Sure. What? You want me to roll around in some mud? <laughs> and, you know, and, and, yes. That's right. Exactly, but they do. They don't change but, the world. I mean, right. You know, they still yeah, that, that's the issue is, is that God gives commands and we obey out of faith, out of trust in what he says about all of that, not because we can make sense out of it from a scientific perspective or some kind of a uh, you know, logical progressive, pro progression. Uh, that's like I'm saying. They're told to walk around the walls, but... They don't, there's no connection between walking around the city and the walls falling down. Uh, but that's not the, the issue is God told them to do it, and God made a promise. And so if they trust that and they believe it, and then they need to comply with it in order to receive what God says they will receive. So a New Testament application, I think, that we can make is number 
two there. It says, God requires faith in his power to save and compliance with his terms to receive his grace. And you see I have Mark 16, 15 and 16 there. That's where the Jesus commissions saying, Go and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And, you know, there's like the first part of the response and the consummating part of the response. You believe what God says, and then you say, what must I do? And it culminates in baptism, right? And clearly, that verse says that the person who does that is the one who will be saved. Now, back to our point, we, we could say, wait, what does water have to do with forgiveness of sins? All it does is cleanse my skin, right? Right? My body's going down there, but I'm wanting my sins forgiven. And so water's not going to do anything for that. It's H2O. So it's the same principle, right? Well, we do it because God is the one that put the connection there. Because he's the one going, that's going to be doing the forgiving. He's the one that's going to be applying the grace to our lives, to our account. Yes. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yes. That's that's right. It's <clears throat> the the foolishness of God. He's using accommodative language there and saying. The philosopher and the wise man of today would say, well, God's word is foolish, right? And in that passage in 1 Corinthians 1, it's like the, the gospel was, the gospel's being preached that this man from Nazareth who was, who was sentenced to death for blasphemy and clearly under the curse of God because he was hang, hanged on a tree on a cross, he's the savior of the world. That's the most ridiculous thing. The, you know, that could be preached, right? And so he's saying, yeah, it's foolish to people who are thinking in worldly terms, right? They're thinking that a savior has to be the powerful king who comes on a war horse and leads an army against Rome. But instead, God's way is, wait, we, we have a sin problem, and the only way to deal with that is to have somebody die in your place. Uh, and it, and it later on in that, I don't know, Later on in that passage, it says the weakness of God is stronger than men. So when you see Christ on the cross, that's a picture of weakness in the sense of he's, he was defeated. He was put to death and he perished at the hands of these men. But really, that's the strong, the strength of God, the power of God. Yes, Clay. Well, this also outlines the principle that we use every day of the law of exclusion. Okay. He told him exactly what to do. He didn't tell him not what to do. Yeah, what not to do. Yeah. Well, what that excludes that excludes yeah that's exactly right so we have to respect what he has to say um, it's okay to say I wonder what the connection is but that doesn't matter if you know or not and if there is a connection that is obvious or not. If he says it, that's how you show respect and love and reverence toward our creator because we believe that he cannot lie. And, and so I, I think that this command is a, is a good example of that principle, right? It's a test of faith. It's a purely positive command. And God is attaching promises to your uh, acceptance of it and your conformity to it. And so that, that's the first part of this. And, of course, the next point is one of the shorter ones on the outline here. It's simply that Israel obeys, right? And so verses 6 through 16, Joshua uh, called the priests and said to them, Now take up the Ark of the Covenant and uh, let the seven priests bear the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Uh, he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city. So he's giving them... Uh, all of these instructions that the commander has given him. And so uh, I think it's interesting in verse 10, Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I say to you, shout. 
then you shall shout. Um, you know, various things come to mind perhaps, but I have on the notes here, <clears throat> it seems that this, uh, that Joshua is viewing this act of obedience as, uh, uh, you know, reverence and worship. To where it's a solemn moment, right? It's we, this, you don't do this flippantly. You do it because God has told you to do this and you, you trust in the God of Israel. And so it's a solemn observance here. They're not, they're, they're to keep in mind that this is an act of God and not uh, an act of, of the power of men. And that's what I have there. I don't know if anybody else has any com thoughts on that, but Joshua told him, don't say anything. Don't be visiting back and forth. You need to be focused on what you're doing, that you're obeying the Lord here, right? Did you tell him that because God told him? <clears throat> well, when he said yeah, of course, we don't have all of that recorded for us, and I don't know. Maybe Joshua is simply giving those instructions as their commander to, to help them to realize, listen, we're, we're doing this out of obedience and worship of God Almighty. We're not doing it of our own accord and... So I'm just bringing out a possibility here as to why he instructed them to do this. Maybe God did tell him to say that, and we just don't have that recorded. Uh, but did, was you going to say something? Wrong? Oh, I was going to say another good word here is, is that it's very intentional. Yes. Worship has to be very intentional. Worship is intentional, yeah. And, yeah, you don't, you don't worship on accident, <laughs> so to speak. Um, very good. Excellent point. And so... Uh, you know, I try to apply each of these points to the New Testament uh, gospel. So letter B there says, the gospel plan of salvation, I'm supposed to say is clear, uh, is clear. And so I have in his example, uh, repent and be baptized based on faith in Christ. Now Acts 2.37 shows the, the, the people's belief in what the message was, right? They, it says they were pricked in the heart when they heard this message. And they cried out, what shall we do? And then the, the uh, instruction was given to those who believed the message, right? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So um, that's how, that's the antitype of what we're looking at here with the instructions from the commander of, of the army. But uh, number three there now, God's grace is given, right? So if you look down in verse, uh, verse 16, let's see, verse, yeah, 16. And the seventh time that it happened, when the priest blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Uh, verse 20 actually records, So the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, and the people went up into the city. So, you know, there is the, um, the grace given. The, the promise is kept because uh, the, the people received it through obedient faith. Uh, and as I say there on letter A, the walls, the walls fall down, but this was a supernatural act of God. This was a miracle which was given by God and not, uh, number one says, walking around the walls does not cause them to collapse. So this is not a military tactic. It is a gift of God conditioned on obedient faith. See, the New Testament makes this very point, doesn't it? In Hebrews 11 and verse 30, it says the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encompassed seven times, right? Or seven days. Uh, so the New Testament capitalizes on this as an example of faith that saves. Uh, the faith saved Israel or gave Israel Israel the victory here because it obeyed. All right. <clears throat> now, I think this is another part of God's grace that we want to consider. Letter B says, after the walls fall, Israel must enter the city and wield the sword against the enemies. Isn't that right? At, at the end of chapter or the end of verse 20, it says, then the people went up into the city every man straight before him, and they took the city. So it's not just that they were to encompass seven days. That was what they needed to do in order to receive entrance into the city by God's power, right? So the walls fell down, but now what do they got to do? You got to take your sword out of the scabbard, and you got to go and fight. 
these men. Okay? And I have here that this is the supernatural and the natural working together. What do I mean by that? Well, it's men, it's that body. Yep. And, but it's God that's going to... Right. So the men, the men of Israel aren't, aren't, aren't uh, having this experience where they're like, oh, okay, something's carrying me into the city. Uh-oh, it's grabbing my sword and it's doing the fighting. They have to have courage enough to say, all right, I trust that God's going to give me the victory here, but I have got to go and give all I've got. I don't understand it. I've got to go and give all that I've got uh, and trust that the Lord is going to uh, cause us to, to win here, right? And, and protect my life. I'm sorry? They got to obey. Yeah, that's still obedience. But it takes effort. It takes courage. It takes energy. It takes time and all of these things. Um, but again, the point is, is that this is not something that because of their military training and their abilities to wield a sword that gives them the victory. You know that did that last Sunday and yeah. 59 it was fine. Um, <laughs> you think it's what? Well, it takes energy and it made me think, well, it takes strength, and I thought, no, it takes energy. God gives you the strength. He gives you the strength okay. you need and you use Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's the way to think through this is, uh, and I think everybody can hear me, can't you? I'm speaking a little louder, and uh, I noticed that Peggy's not here this morning, and she usually needs the earpiece, so I'll just try to speak up a little bit, and that way I think everyone can hear. Uh, but, yeah, that's the way to think through this, right? Um, and it's the same thing that, uh, that applies to today, to all of God's people even today. Uh, number two there under B says, as God's people, what, swing the sword in faith, God places the sword on the target. Do you see the point? So they're, they're trying to fight as best they can. They're not trained. I mean, they've been slaves in Egypt, right? Or they, they've been in the wilderness trying to survive. All of these things. So they're not exactly trained soldiers, but... They're trusting God, and so they go and do what they can. And God places that sword in the hearts of those sinners that deserve his judgment. That's, that's what I think is going on here. Uh, I have an example after that says, David slings the stone, but who guided the stone? Yeah, it went right into the opening of the armor of Goliath right in his forehead. Now, certainly David would have you know, been out in the field slinging stones while he's watching sheep. You know, we always make that kind of point. But David wouldn't have thought, okay, it was because of my skill, right? No, it's because the battle is the Lord's. And so that's what, that's the point I think that we want to make. I guess I did cite Hebrews 13, 1 through 6. Uh, I was trying to think of a good passage that was succinct enough to make this point, and this came to mind, but I was also kind of in a hurry, so there are probably others better, better, but... Hebrews 13, 1 through 6 gives some instructions about Christians uh, serving God, right? Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers. Verse 3 says, remember prisoners as if chained with them. Verse 4 says, marriage is honorable among all, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with the things that you have. So these are all instructions for us to go into the world and live faithfully to God and, you know, love and serve others. And then what does it say? He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man really do to me? So hopefully you're seeing the, the point that we're applying from Joshua chapter 6, right? So just like they had to go and wield the sword, we have to go wield the sword in the world that we live in, but we have to trust, of course, that God will guide it uh, as he sees fit as we respond in faith. And I think that was exactly David's attitude when he went to see Goliath. 
it, yeah. Who is this Philistine giant that he should defy the army of the living God? Now we're seeing the commander of the armies of the Lord in Joshua 6. And he's the one who's given the victory, right? So David felt the same way. Joshua felt the same way. And we're supposed to feel the same way as well. And so letter C there says Israel could claim no merit in this victory. <clears throat> they trust in God's promise to give them the city. And they obey his instructions. And therefore they receive the city as a gift. And of course, we have to apply this to today. And this is the point we try to make with the Calvinists or with the faith, uh, faith alone advocates and such in the world to say, to say that you have to respond to God's word uh, with, with free, free will obedience is not to say that you therefore earn your own salvation. No, the Bible doesn't say that that's how it works. The Bible says it was a, it's a requirement in order for God's free gift to be appropriated. Uh, I have Colossians 2.12. I like the way that this is phrased because it makes the point we're trying to make. <clears throat> Colossians 2 and verse 12. It talks about when we're buried with Christ in baptism. But notice the wording here. It says, we're buried with Him in baptism, and it's in which, that is in baptism, that you also were raised with Him. So there's a resurrection that takes place in baptism, right? You come up out of the water, but it's a resurrection through faith in the power of God. The working of God, the energeo. So it's the power, the working, the activity of God. So who's really doing the work in baptism? God. And that's the whole point that I try to make with people who claim, you know, you, you say baptism is necessary. Well, that's just a work. You're saying you're saved by works. Who is working in baptism? God is doing the work. It says it right here. And, and isn't the whole... Uh, illustration or picture that is given in baptism the fact that you are not doing any work that's the whole point you're dead and you need to be buried so you're doing nothing now I realize that you're the one who says okay I need to be baptized and then you get up and you walk to the baptistry but that's not meritorious work that's obedience and then the person who does the real work in baptism is God. He's the one that forgives you. Christ is the one that died for you and so forth. Uh, and so it's through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So when you're buried in baptism, since you're dead and you do no work, then you're raised in baptism. But you're still not doing any work because it's God who raises you from the dead. Uh, it, it's really not that difficult, but when you have years and years of denominational thinking and indoctrination about salvation in your mind, it's, it's hard for people to, to grasp what, what we're saying here, but it's as clear as, as, as Colossians 2.12. Yes. Yeah, that all they have to do is... that's the accusation that would be leveled at us by people who believe that God does everything and you don't even, you're not, if well, you, if you, you say, yeah, and if you do anything, then somehow you're trying to earn your salvation. That's the accusation they would level at us. And, and I'm trying to show you how, the, yeah, the Bible is making the point that you don't do any work in this salvific sense, in this meritorious sense. It's God who is doing the work from beginning to end, so to speak. Um, now, there are other passages where you could see the word work in a way that is used, again, not in a meritorious sense, but in a sense of obedience. So James 2 says you're not justified by faith alone, you're justified by works. Well, we know he doesn't mean meritorious works. He means works of obedience, works of faith. Just like the Israelites marching around the walls. Uh, so, 
Yeah, and that, that is your faith must act. Your faith must obey. You have to wield the sword in the battle uh, with trust that God will guide it. I don't know, those kinds of things. I, I think these lessons are clear enough, especially to those of you who've been in the church many years because you've heard it many times, but uh, it's, it bears repeating just because of uh, the religious climate that we live in. So uh, there, there's another point I want to make. We have five minutes in class, and I want to make this before the, the, the class is over because now I'm kind of focusing on what comes next, right? So we're, we're baptized into Christ. <coughs> Well, what comes next? Uh, so I have here on uh, the fourth main point, Israel's battle against temptation and sin. Now, we're going to introduce a, a concept here. You see I have the Hebrew word cherim is how you would pronounce that. Uh, but it's translated in various ways in your Bibles. Sometimes it's called the ban or the accursed thing uh, or devoted to destruction. Those are the kinds of phrases you'll read. Uh, but this introduces us to this concept of remaining pure from the world uh, since you're a child of God, right? You need to completely eradicate evil from your life. And this is seen in a figurative sense when Joshua is told to go and eliminate <laughs> Jericho. Everything in it. Tear down everything, burn it to the ground, and destroy all the people. Right? Well, this is a concept that God is trying to get into our minds. It says, when you are a child of God, you cannot fellowship sin in any way. You cannot be friends with it. You've you got to take it all out of your life. And, and that's, that's the idea. So let's see how it's worded here. Back in Joshua chapter 6 here. <clears throat> So verses 17 and following says, Now the city shall be, and here's that word, cherem, doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Now, of course, only Rahab the harlot, we, we talked about her last time, remember. So she's going to be spared because she declared faith in the God of Israel and sided with God's armies, right? Uh, but look at verse 18. But... We're in Joshua 6, 18. And you, by all means, abstain from the cherem. There it is again. The accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. You think he's trying to make a point here with this word curse. This is this technical word that I've been, that's on your notes there. That is very important, I think, for the idea of the conquest. And uh, verse 19, it goes on to say, But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron, they are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So this is the nature of this ban or curse that is placed upon Jericho. Uh, everything is to be burnt, all the people are to be destroyed, and then he gives more instruction about the silver and the gold and all these things. They're not to be taken to your house. You don't get to keep them. So the, the spoils of war are not for your personal profit. They're going to be used in the tabernacle. They're going to be used in service to the Lord. See the point? And so, now, the instructions of the cherem will change from time to time. God will give specific instructions. Sometimes they'll just say, burn it all. Sometimes, sometimes he'll even allow them to take some of it or give it to the priest or do this or that, right? But it's, it's the concept here of continued obedience to the Lord in trust. And it's also a good point to make to those who bring up an ethical problem with the conquest as if Israel is just going in there of their own accord and wiping out an ethnic group of people, right, for their own benefit. This is not that. This is God's judgment on sinners who refuse to repent. And so Israel's not personally profiting from their own accord. They'll only profit to the point that God wants to grace them with, their, with goods, right? As he says in Deuteronomy, you'll, you'll live in houses that you didn't build and 
You'll eat from vineyards that you didn't plant and stuff like that. So they will be graced, but it still all goes back to God's gift here. It doesn't go to their, uh, to their own righteousness. Uh, so let's just, uh, that's the last bill, isn't it? I'm going to read through the, uh, the notes, and you can read some of these uh, uh, cross-references uh, on your own. But it says here, uh, letter A, Israel is told that everything in the city is doomed to destruction. This is an important concept in Israel's wars. All the spoils are given to the Lord, either by burning or used in the tabernacle. Israel must destroy the people lest they fall into the same idolatry. And that's what those passages in Deuteronomy emphasize. Israel must abstain from the accursed things. They may not, not take booty for themselves. Um, of course, letter C there applies it to Christian, the Christian life. Colossians 3, 1 and following says, If you're raised with Christ, seek those things above. Don't set your mind on things on the earth. So the conclusion here says, We are saved by grace through faith. And we must continue to separate ourselves from the sinful world and keep ourselves from the accursed things. But the next chapter of Joshua is a warning against failing in this struggle. Will you stay strong in your battle for holiness? Look at Joshua 7.1 and the lesson is yours. But the children of Israel committed a sin regarding the accursed things. And that will be our lesson for next time to show... Uh, the importance of this uh, this principle. Thanks for bearing with me there at the last. I remember as a sixth grader sitting in class and the secretary of the school came over the PA and said that President Reagan has just been shot. And it was a surreal moment, really, because any time the President of the United States has been shot is a significant moment for the whole nation. And of course, we know that he eventually survived that uh, gunshot wound, but it did call to mind uh, for a lot of people that fateful day in 1963 when President um, it just escaped me. JFK, Kennedy, President Kennedy was assassinated. And if you're old enough to remember that, you probably remember where you were, uh, what you were doing when the news uh, was broke that he was shot in Dallas. We were just in downtown Dallas last week and we drove right over that spot. And it's marked on the road there by that museum the very place where he was shot. Uh, but it's, it's a huge, a huge shock to the nation when the leader dies. And Isaiah says that it was in the year that Uzziah died in Israel. This is significant because Uzziah reigned for more than 50 years in Israel. In Judah, really, the king of Judah. And uh, he became king when he was 16 years old. He had a lot of good qualities about him. He instituted various reforms uh, and rid the nation uh, of idolatry in various ways. Now, he eventually died in disgrace, unfortunately. He violated his own principles. But it was a very difficult time for Judah for God's people. It was a time in their spiritual life now when things went into a spiral nosedive for many, many decades to where the spiritual life of the nation seemed to suffer consistently and constantly. But what is to become of the nation when they hear that their king has just died? Well, it was at this time that the greatest court prophet was called to service. And Isaiah is recording that in chapter 6. That it was in the year that Isaiah died that God called him to be a prophet to the kings that would follow. And of course, Isaiah is known as the Messianic prophet because he speaks so often of this coming king 
who would fulfill the will of God in the way that God always intended his kings to fulfill it. And that this great prophet was not only to be a great, uh, this great Messiah was to be not only a great king, but he was also to be a suffering servant. And so with four servant songs, Isaiah would paint a picture of this great king that is to come into the world and yet not triumph in the way that we would consider a king to triumph, but instead he would suffer on behalf of his people in order to deliver them from their sins. But he gets a glimpse of this king. It's, it's an amazing vision. It's an amazing sight that Isaiah is privileged to be able to see. Because, I mean, we live in a nation that seems to be in a spiritual nosedive. We, we live in a nation that seems to be on a fast track away from the Creator in every possible way and destined for a quick entrance into the punishment of hell. And yet we need to remember with Isaiah that there is one who sits on the throne and that we serve him, that he is our heart. He is our joy. He is the one that we look to for hope and assurance and stability when all else seems to be spiraling out of control. And so the timing of this particular vision is significant, but the vision itself is the lesson, I think, of this particular passage because he says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. What is it that Isaiah saw? Well, if you have uh, your English translation in front of you, you see the word Lord in verse 1. It's capital L, but it's lowercase o-r-d, as you can see there. Now, if you go down to verse 3, you can see in the song that was sung by the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the, the Lord, and there you see capital L, and then capital O-R-D that follows. Now, this is an English translation's way of explaining there are two different words behind these same English words, Lord. And this is a significant difference. Because the capital L-O-R-D is a way to refer to the covenant name of the Old Testament God who called Moses at the burning bush. He is the great Yahweh. He is the great I Am. And so that's the way that Israel would refer to their covenant God. And so there's no question but that we're talking here about the God of heaven that we worship and that spoke all things into existence and that was Israel's God and deity. But that's not the word that's used in the first verse, surprisingly, because you would expect, of course, Isaiah to maybe use that word to refer to the one that he saw sitting on the throne. Now, I don't know what all you can make of this in any definitive way, but it's something that's interesting to consider. Because the word that's translated Lord in verse 1 is the word from the Hebrew Adonai, or Adonai, uh, that means the master, the sovereign one, the Lord, but it's not the covenant name of the Old Testament God. Now, why this is significant is because the psalmist in Psalm 110 would also use these two different words, but he would be speaking here about Yahweh speaking to his own Lord, as if deity is speaking to deity. And of course, this is a psalm that's used in the New Testament to refer to God the Father speaking to God the Son, Jesus Christ. The Lord, Yahweh, said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And this is indeed God the Father speaking to God the Son. What is it that Isaiah saw? I believe there are good reasons to believe that he saw a picture, a vision. He got to see a picture of Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of glory before its time. If you will keep your finger back in Isaiah, but turn with me to John 12, this is too important to overlook. But in John chapter 12, John quotes from this very chapter, Isaiah 6. And he says in John chapter 12 and verse 39, 
speaking about Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ, it says they could not believe. Why? Because Isaiah said, and then he quotes from Isaiah 6 later in the chapter, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should hear with, uh, see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. And verse 41 says this, Isaiah said, when he saw his glory and spoke about him. Seems to me that John is saying Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. And he spoke about the glory of Jesus. And he spoke about the fact that they rejected Jesus even though he spoke the gospel to them. They were blind in their eyes. They were deaf in their ears. They didn't understand with their hearts as this very passage goes on to explain. But I think that that is a significant, a significant truth to see that at Isaiah's call to be a great prophet, a court prophet to the kings of Israel, that he was called by the great Messiah himself. Adonai means the one who is sovereign, the one who really has all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew chapter 12, uh, 28 rather, verses 18 through 20. So King Isaiah is dead, but King Messiah is continues to rule and Isaiah will answer the call won't he I want us to be able to to get a glimpse in some small way a reflection of what Isaiah himself saw because what we're doing when we come together at times like this is is striving to see that glory aren't we we're striving to get a taste of what it means to behold Jesus Christ in his perfect rule, in his reign. We're subjects, we're citizens of his kingdom. And it is fit and proper for us to exalt him and lift him up high and to worship him in our songs and in our singing. You've noticed that the songs Jeremy has chosen, many of them come from themes from this chapter. The holiness of God, the glory of God, even answering the call to go and be a mouthpiece for God. Here am I, send me. And so we see the glory and the holiness explained. The rest of verse 1 says, The train of his robe filled the temple. And of course, the, the dress of the king the presentation of the king in his glory, in all of his regal majesty, was often summed up in the length of the train. Now, I don't know if anyone is old enough to, to remember Queen Elizabeth when she was coronated. That would be too old for, any, for anybody in here, right? I mean, there are some old people in here, okay? But I just want... No. <laughs> <clears throat> but it was the first televised coronation, right? But do you remember they had to have the attendants follow her and pull the train of her robe? But it was to be a reflection of her glory, of her majesty. That's the idea. With all the pomp and the ceremony that the, that the British can muster. <laughs> but, but what you're seeing here is that Isaiah sees this one on the throne and the train of his robe was unfurled and it just it filled every crack and crevice of the temple there was no place in the temple where the train of his robe was not found that's a symbol of sovereignty that's a symbol of glory and that's what we strive to taste as we worship this one who sits on the throne and what a comfort it is to to know that when we are faced with all the uncertainties that our culture presents with us, uh, pr presents to us. Uh, what's going to become of, of my children, of my grandchildren, my future grandchildren, which, by the way, we need to get busy on that. Um, <clears throat> no, don't mean to call anybody on the carpet here, but what, what's to become of my grandchildren? 
Well, you know what? Jesus Christ is on the throne. And I can know that. And I can know that he can work for the good of those who love him. To those who are the called according to his purpose. I can know that because of what Isaiah is recording for us right here. So we've seen the glory. And next we see the holiness. Because above it, verse 2, stood seraphim. And these are six-winged creatures. I don't know what all is involved in that. It's an interesting picture, of course, of these creatures. We know that they would be disembodied. They would be uh, unembodied, I guess I should say. Angelic. We often refer to them as angelic creatures. And so they are in the presence of God, in the very direct presence of God. So they are throne attendants. Uh, as many would understand the word seraph to mean. These are glorious ones. These are the ones who are so close to the glory of the God who sits on the throne that they reflect His glory in such a way that makes them bright and shining and glorious themselves. Not of their own glory, but of a reflection of the Creator's glory. And so they are uh, in such direct relationship with the glorious one that they have to cover their face. They have to cover their bodies so that they won't be consumed by the great glory of the one who sits on the throne. And we remember this from Moses' lesson. You remember when he asked God to just get a glimpse. Let me see a glimpse of your glory. And God said, you, no one can see my face and survive it. And so he accommodated Moses by putting him in a cleft in the rock and passing by. He had to cover Moses' face and then he had to cover until he got by and then he let Moses see just the, the, the text says the hind quarters, the, the backside so to speak because a direct sight would consume Moses. Think about that. You remember when Moses came down from the mountain and because of his being in the presence of God his own face was bright and shining. And the people of Israel said, you got to put something on your face because your face is reflecting a reflection of the hindquarters of the glory of God. See, that's the lesson that we're trying to, to imbibe from what Isaiah is explaining here. Because this is, this is a truth that the Bible reveals to us about our God, the one that we worship today when we lift our voice and when we bow our head. This is a lesson about Him that, that can only be understood to the extent that a person has spiritually conditioned himself to, to see it. You're, you're not just going to understand it or see it by reading words off of a page. You're only going to be able to see it to the extent that you are devoted to this one and that you worship him with all of your being. But it is a glorious moment, isn't it? And so these creatures who we would probably perish being in the presence of because they're so close in the reflection of the Lord. They are actually singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so they are repeating this phrase holy in order to make emphasis, right? Of course, we sing this song. We sing it in this worship and I love the song. Could you imagine what this song would have sounded like, though? Being sung by these beautiful creatures. <clears throat> now, just like in English, the Jews had techniques to emphasize uh, points that they wanted to make. Verbal repetition was one of them. And so that's why you read the repetition. A threefold repetition. Now, usually, this... Emphasis is made just by a twofold repetition, like when Jesus would say something like, Truly, truly, I say unto you. It's not as if the other things weren't quite as true. It's that he's trying to emphasize a certain point that he wants to make. 
Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verses 3 through 5. Or Paul would say the same thing, a similar thing in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And he would say, you know, if we or an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel to you, than that which we have preached, preached to you, let him be accursed. And just as I have said, so now I say again. And so he would repeat himself. But there's only one time that a threefold emphasis is made, and it is about the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy. This is the song, of course, that John heard in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 whenever he got a glimpse into this same vision, I believe, that Isaiah saw uh, centuries before that. The lesson this morning is, is rather straightforward and rather simple, and I hope that it's, it's something that can be meaningful to you as you contemplate these words. But the response of Isaiah should be our response. The response to God's holiness and getting a glimpse of it. I mean, even the inanimate objects in this scene quake with terror. Don't they? Verse 4. The posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. The house was filled with smoke. But notice Isaiah's own response. Woe is me. I am undone. I think this is the proper response. Because the more we see the holiness of God, the more our own... Uh, unworthiness is reflected in our own hearts and in our own minds and that's as it should be this is what drives worship this is what helps us to see that there is but one who is worthy of worship and it's not us contrary to our culture what you see when you walk out the door is constant promotion of self-worship the idolatry of self. But see, the Bible's message is, is completely con uh, contrary to that. And Isaiah is showing it here. I, I am broken into a million pieces. I have come undone because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So he recognizes his unworthiness to stand in the presence of such a sight, of such a person. And he confesses that he is unworthy and that, that he's unclean. So clearly what he needs is cleansing. Do you, do you realize that you need that? Now, I know that you can say that pretty, pretty easily. You can say it out loud. I need cleansing. You know, I'm a sinner, yada, yada, yada. I'm saying, do you really understand that? Does that really strike you? That you are in eternal trouble. You are under eternal condemnation because you are a sinner. And your only hope is the same hope that Isaiah had right here. Is that the one who sits on the throne would cleanse you. This is a neat uh, concept in the, in the Old Testament about uncleanness, the laws of uncleanness. You know what could be passed on through touch? Uncleanness. You know what could not be passed on through touch? Cleanness. So if you touch a dead body, you touch something that is ceremonially unclean, if you are ceremonially clean, guess what you are now? You're unclean. And you have to go through the ritual washings. You have to go through whatever is prescribed by the law of Moses and the time that's required before you can be considered clean again. There's no way for you, even if you've been de declared clean through the ceremony, that you can touch anything and make it clean. Because that's the way it works. That's the way... It works in a world that God, a holy God, creates. So that's why the world is full of uncleanness. He dwells in the midst of people of unclean lips. Uncleanness everywhere. 
and there's going to be no way to spread the cleanness. Well, except one. And that's only going to be when God himself sends the cleanness to you, sends the cleansing to you. One of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand in his hand a live coal, from which he had taken with the tongs of the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. You remember in Mark 1 when Jesus uh, is approached by the leper? And the leper begs that Jesus would touch him to make him clean. And Jesus reaches down and touches him. I have some commentators in my library that claim that that made Jesus unclean because he touched a leper. And of course, the law of Moses says if you touch a leper, you're unclean. So Jesus was ceremonially unclean. Now, I know that they wouldn't say he was a sinner, but they're trying to make the point that he's ceremonially unclean because he touched the leper. And my point is that the Bible is teaching the exact opposite, that Jesus is the only one who can touch a leper and not be unclean. Instead, his cleanness, his cleansing is transferred to the leper. That's the whole point of Mark 1. Has Jesus touched you? Have you been cleansed by the Lord? Isaiah goes on to say, Then I heard the voice of the Lord Adonai, the one on the, on the throne. And he said, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And that's when Isaiah answered the call. Here am I. Send me. How privileged we are this morning to be able to, to come before the throne that we just read about in Isaiah 6 and verse 1. You realize that? That when we come to worship, we, we stand before that throne. Now I realize it's in, a, it's in the spiritual realm. It's not something we can see with our eyes, which we should be thankful for. Because we would just be utterly consumed. But it's real nonetheless. Now the only question is... Do you see it? Do you, do you realize it? Do you bow down before it? Do you embrace it by faith? Because this is what Jesus Christ has made possible for you and me because of his sacrifice on the cross. He's the great mediator between God and man, himself man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as the propitiation, the atonement sacrifice for sin. We strain to behold the glory of God. It takes effort. It takes humility. But it's always worthwhile. And I hope in some way that this lesson has helped us to focus on the great things that the Bible reveals to us. And now not just know them with our mind, but that we might understand them with our hearts so that we might turn and that we might be healed by Jesus Christ. If anyone here needs to be healed by Jesus Christ, needs to answer the call to obey the gospel, to repent and to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, this is a great opportunity to do so. You can answer that call and receive the cleansing of God today. If you are a Christian but you need the prayers and the help of the church, this is a time to do so as well. While together we stand and sing.